sit down. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, this morning we come before your presence with thanksgiving in our hearts. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to come and worship. Thank you for your word that is living and it is powerful. It is a sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing the soul and the spirit. The Bible says that the entrance of your word brings light and understanding to the simple. We pray that you may speak to our hearts this morning and minister to each one of us. For this is a prayer of faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, this morning, I am uh, delighted to be here. Thank you, uh, Reverend, for the invitation to come and minister to us the word of God. My name is Vasco Muraguri, and Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. I serve in uh, PCA Nyamashaki Parish, that is in Nyeri Presbytery, and uh, I'm married. Uh, we have three children, and uh, my family sends uh, greetings. Praise the Lord. Uh, today, we are observing the PCMF Sunday, and uh, the theme that has been given to us is uh, godliness and contentment builds reconciliation and peace. And this is coming from uh, the book of Genesis uh, towards the end of uh, the life of uh, Joseph. When uh, we think of our society, we look at uh, the ideal society that will be peaceful, where people are living in harmony, where people are godly, where people have no conflict, where people there is no strife between the people. But when we look at our society, we find that uh, the four qualities or the four things that have been mentioned in our theme are missing. And therefore today, I'm going to look at the four things as we meditate upon the theme, uh, godliness, contentment, we are going to look at reconciliation, and then we'll look at peace. Each one of these uh, can be a topic on their own, uh, but for today, we are going to look at the four of them, and we are going to start with godliness. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 6 that godliness and contentment is a great gain. And number, thing, number one uh, thing that we need to remember is that uh, we can train ourselves to be godly. That is what uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7 says, have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. So that means that uh, as we train ourselves in other uh, disciplines, we can also train ourselves to be godly. Number two is that uh, we have already been given the necessary things for godliness. So God has already provided what is required for us in order to be godly. In Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 2 and 3, the Bible says that grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And in verse 3 he says, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So by the divine power of Jesus Christ, he has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So in order for us to be godly, everything has been provided. Number three is that godliness means keeping the right company. In Psalms chapter 1 and verse 1, the Bible says that blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor starts in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. There are three things that have been mentioned. Walking, studying, and sitting. And he's saying that blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor starts in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. So that means that if we walk in the counsel of the ungodly, or we study in the path of sinners, or sit in the seat of the scornful, then we are not going to be godly. We can get an example of Enoch, who walked with God for 300 years, and he was taken because the Bible says that he preached the Lord. And therefore, when we talk about godliness, it means keeping the right company. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, do not be deceived if a company corrupts good morals or good habits. And therefore, the company that you keep, you are going to develop the character of the company that you keep. And therefore, when we walk with God, then we are going to be uh, godly. There is a phrase that we use in English, that the birds of the same feather will flock together. 
but we can refresh it and say that the birds that will flock together will develop the same feathers. Praise the Lord. Number four, godliness means being holy. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15 and verse 16, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. So since it is God who has called us to be holy, himself he is holy. And he is telling us that in order for us to be godly, then we ought to be holy as he is holy. Number five, godliness means not conforming to the world. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. And Paul writing to the Romans in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, he says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And therefore, you cannot be able to love the world and walking in the things of the world or doing the things that the world will do and then you say that you are, world, uh, you are godly. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15, the Bible says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So that means that we are in the world, but we are not of the world. We cannot things like the world who do their things. Because when we are godly, we do things like God would do them. Then number six is godliness means conforming to Jesus Christ. So if you are not conforming to the world, and the word to conform means to take shape, and therefore if you are not taking shape according to the world, then we take shape according to God. And this is in Romans 8 and verse 29. The Bible says that for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, uh, brothers and sisters. So what we are saying is that if you are not conforming to the world, then what should we conform to? We conform to Jesus Christ. That means that we think like Jesus Christ would think, we talk that like Jesus Christ would talk, then we do things as Jesus would do them. I was thinking about uh, Jesus himself coming to visit us. If Jesus Christ was to visit us in person and stay with us for a week at home, are there some things that would change? The things that we watch on TV, would they change? The utterance says that we speak to one another as husbands and wives and even to the children, would they change? Would we change the habits? Would we change our character? Would we change the way we relate to one another? That means that if there is something that would change if Jesus Christ would come and visit her with us, then it means that uh, we ought to change and start conforming to Jesus Christ. Number seven is that godliness means walking in the light. When the Bible is talking about walking in the light, it means walking or doing things that would be acceptable before God. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 8, the Bible says, For you were once darkness, but now you are a light in the world. Walk as children of light. When you talk about walking in the right, it means that whatever we are doing, we are doing something that we can do even in the presence of people. Somebody said that the character is who you are when no one is watching. And that means that what you do when you are alone, can you do it if somebody else was with you? And that is what it means to walk in the light. Is that what you are doing, what you are saying, you can do it even in front of other people. Having looked at that about godliness, let us now go to contentment. When we talk about contentment, people will think that uh, contentment means lack of ambition and lack of vision. And I will say number one is that contentment does not mean lack of ambition. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, the Bible says, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to, uh, to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So God will move us from one glory to another. And when we talk about that, it means that God is going to move us from humble beginnings, as Zachariah 4.10 says, that who despises the time of humble beginnings, and he will take us to the next level, and the next level, and the next level. But in the level that we are in, we should be content. And that means that contentment does not mean lack of ambition. Let us be ambitious. Let us have that vision 
Habakkuk is saying, write the vision and put it in plain letters, in capital letters. So let us be ambitious as possible, but where we are, let us be content. Number two about contentment is that contentment is a learned disposition. Just as godliness, uh, Paul has written to Timothy and says, train yourself to be godly, we can also learn to be content. And when he is writing now to Timothy and saying, learn yourself, teach yourself or train yourself to be godly, he says, I have also learned to be content. In Philippians 4, 11 and following, the Bible says, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am in to be content. So that is something that he had learned. And it's something also we can learn. And that is why we are saying that contentment is a learned, uh, learned disposition. Verse 12 says, I know how to be a beast and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. So he's saying, I have learned. So whatever situation he was in, he learned to be content. Whether he was hungry, he was content. Whether he was without clothes, he was content. He knew how to abound, he knew how to suffer need, he was content. Number three, contentment means being satisfied with what we have. In Hebrews 13 and verse 5, the Bible says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. So this is the writer of the Hebrews. To the Hebrews and he is saying, Be content with such things as you have. I know that uh, when it comes to contentment, we are always looking for the next thing. No. Now that the weekend is coming uh, to an end, we are looking forward to the next weekend. We are looking forward to the next month. We are looking forward to the next purchase. We are looking uh, forward to the next year. So we are always looking for the next thing, the next thing. And when we buy, you know, when you want to buy something, you, you, know, you, you feel that you have the desire. This is the thing that I must have. And then the moment you buy it, you enjoy it for a few months, and then after that you want to have the next purchase and the next one. So, but the Bible is telling us, be content with things that you have. Number four, contentment comes by knowing that God is the giver. Contentment comes by knowing that God is the giver. In James chapter 1 and verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. So having known that uh, God has given you what you have, and even as we trust him for the things that we have not yet received, then we will be content because we know that at the right time, he is going to make everything beautiful and he will provide for us. And therefore, if you do not have something and you desire, you just put it to God, trust it to God, and he will give you because every gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the father of rights. Then number five about contentment is that contentment is the medicine for jealousy and envy. Are Christian envious? Yes. Sometimes we become envious of people and we, have, uh, we allow jealousy to rule in our hearts. In James chapter 3 and verse 16, the Bible says that where Envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. So if you are content or contented, then that will be the medicine for jealousy and envy. Number six about contentment is that contentment means no complaining. Because as the Bible has said in Hebrews 13 and verse 5, be content as with what you have, then there will be no complaining. If you look at the children of Israel, God is taking them to the promised land. And in the wilderness, the only thing that they do is to complain. If you read at Numbers 14 and verse 26 and 27, the Bible says, And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? I have heard the complaints which the children of Israel make against me. So they would complain about the weather. They would complain about water. They would complain about food. They would complain about almost everything. And don't forget that God was there. He was providing for them. He was fighting their battles. He was working with them. But they were complaining all the time. 
But when we are content, then we will not uh, complain. Having looked at uh, contentment, now we can go to number three, reconciliation. Reconciliation is the process of two people or groups in a conflict agreeing to make amends or come to a truce or come to peace. And number one about reconciliation, there are two types of reconciliation. Reconciliation to God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So Paul is writing to the Corinthians and he is saying, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And that means that uh, since the Bible is telling us that we need to be reconciled to God, why do we need to be reconciled to God? It's because we are enemies of God. And the only way that we can be, be reconciled to God is by coming to Christ. So that is number one, reconciliation, reconciliation to God. And number two is reconciliation to man. In Colossians 3, 13, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has complained against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. So there is that reconciliation between men. So what we would call vertical reconciliation and horizontal reconciliation is very important. So as the Bible is telling us, as the theme is talking to us, that uh, godliness and contentment builds reconciliation. So it is reconciliation to God and also reconciliation to man. Number two about reconciliation is that reconciliation is only through Jesus Christ. The same Second Corinthians chapter 5, now this is in verse 18, says that all, now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So reconciliation is through Jesus Christ. And since we are our enemies to God, when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior, that is the time that we are reconciled to God. And therefore, if you are here and you are not born again, this might look like it is very harsh, but I want to tell you that you are still an enemy of God. You may be coming to church, you may be giving, you may be serving, you may even have a leadership position, but if you are not yet born again, you have not accepted to be reconciled to God. And if you are not reconciled to God, then you are an enemy of God. Number three about reconciliation is that the ministry of reconciliation has been given to us men. This is the same uh, verse, uh, verse 19 now, of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It says, that is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So the ministry of reconciliation has been given to men. And that is why every time in church, in fellowships, we will tell people, be reconciled to God. Even the people who are out there will tell them, be reconciled to God. And even there is conflict among men, we will tell them, be reconciled with one another. So this message has not been given to the ages, or the seraphim, or the cherubims, or the, uh, the 24 elders. It has been given to us men. And therefore, as church leaders will say, be reconciled to God, and be reconciled to one another. And the same message, you will take it to the people, and tell them, be reconciled to God, be reconciled to one another. Number four about reconciliation is that reconciliation is intentional. Jesus Christ, in Matthew chapter 18, he is giving us a formula of reconciliation. In verse 15 he says, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. If you continue verse 16, talking about take another person with you, then after that you can tell the church, after that you can give up on the person. But in verse 15 he say, if a brother or a sister has sinned against you, go and tell him or her his fault or her fault. So that means it is intentional. And there are people who are seated here and other people who are listening on our other media platforms. And they are saying, I cannot go to my brother. I cannot go to my sister. I cannot call my mother. I cannot call my father. No. So, but the Bible is telling us that uh, reconciliation is intentional. 
you make up your mind and say i am going to be reconciled with my father i'm going to be reconciled with my child i'm going to be reconciled with my neighbor it is very intentional it is not something that will come automatic it is something that you intend to do and therefore when we live here if there is somebody that you need to be reconciled to then be reconciled you remember jesus saying that if you are bringing your offering and you remember that you have your brother has something against you what did he say leave your offering go first of all be reconciled with your brother then come and make the offering so that is intentional because you can bring the offering and say forget about reconciliation but god is telling us this morning reconciliation is intentional number 5 about reconciliation is that reconciliation demands humility i know what might be standing between us and reconciliation is our ego and our pride that i cannot do that in genesis chapter 33 jacob is coming back and he is coming back with his wives and concubines and children and the wealth that he had acquired and he remembers that what he did to his brother esau and in verse 2 the bible says and he put the maid servants and their children in front lea and her children behind and lecho and joseph last then he crossed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother you can see jacob although he has encountered god uh, when he was uh, wrestling god now he is humbled and verse 3 is saying then he crossed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother so you can imagine this is jacob you know what he has been doing and now he is humbled and he is bowing himself seven times before a sow before he came to him and therefore the consideration will demand humility from your side not as necessarily from the other person but from your side and say i don't want ego to stand on my way i want to be reconciled with my brother even people who are not reconciled to god maybe you need to humble yourself and say i need to humble myself before god so that i can be reconciled to him and having looked at that let's come to the fourth thing peace when we talk about peace this is a word that we mention all the time we are coming from election hearing period election period and the church has been praying for peace and therefore peace is a word that is almost on our lips on a daily basis and this word peace is derived from the original latin word pax which means a pact or a control or an agreement to end war or any dispute and conflict between two people two nations or two antagonistic groups of people just as we looked at two types of reconciliation let's look at two types of peace that is what we call the internal peace you know the one the peace that is inside of us in john chapter 14 verse 27 Jesus says peace I leave with you my peace I give to you not as the world gives do I give to you let not your heart be troubled neither let it be afraid so Jesus is saying when you have money in the bank you will have peace when you have already paid your mortgage you will have peace when you have insurance you will have peace but he's saying I want to give you peace not like is given by the things of this world so you need to have peace in yourself So as we thank God for the peace in the nation can we say that since the nation is in peace everybody has peace not necessarily because people we might li- be living in a nation that ha- that is peaceful but inside of us there is a lot of conflict and we do not have peace that is what we are calling internal peace but there is also number 2 external peace and when you talk about external peace this is the peace that occurs in society in the nations and the world and this can be described as the absence of war absence of hostility absence of agitation absence of social disorder absence of disturbances absence of social injustice social inequality violence violation of human rights riots terrorism and etc that is external peace and therefore we can have external peace and we do not have peace that is internal or we can have internal peace and we do not have external peace so either of them when god is telling us that godliness and contentment builds reconciliation and peace 
it is the two types of peace in, internal peace and also external peace number two is Jesus Christ is the prince of peace this is the famous verse that we read during Christmas Isaiah 9 6 for unto us a child is born unto us a child is given and the government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called wonderful counselor mighty God everlasting father prince of peace so he is the prince of peace Jesus Christ number three about peace is that peace comes through trusting in God so in Isaiah 26 and verse 3 you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you so there is the perfect peace that is written by Isaiah and it was only come to those whose mind is stayed on God because we trust in him when we trust in God we will have that perfect peace number four we can get peace through prayer. I know that uh, when we give benediction, we will quote uh, Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7. That uh, the peace of God that surpasses human understanding will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. But sometimes I ask myself, can we have imputed peace? You know, such that uh, the minister will pronounce peace on you and you have peace. But if you look at the previous uh, verses, Verse 6 says, be not be anxious about anything, but in prayer and supplication and with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. So is there a relationship between verse 6 and verse 7? Such that do not be anxious about anything, but by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, make your request known to God, so that now you can have the peace that surpasses human understanding. Praise the Lord. So when we pray and we make our requests known unto God, and we can ask ourselves this morning, is that the thing that is making you lack peace, have you made it known to God? Because the Bible is saying, make your request known to God. So if you have made the request known to God, then you should have peace, because God already knows about your request. Number five about peace is obedience to God's word will bring peace. This is in Psalms 119 and verse 165. The Bible says, Great peace have those who love your law, and nothing causes to stumble. So, Isaiah 26 verse 3 is talking about perfect peace. And now the psalmist in Psalms 119 and verse 165, he's talking about great peace. So you can have perfect peace and great peace. And this great peace have those who love the law of God. So the law of God, when we love it, it will make us have great peace. And then number six, and the last one, is that peace takes effort. This is in Hebrews 12 and verse 14. The Bible says, Pursue peace with all people, and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So that means something that we are told to pursue, it means it is elusive. It is not something that will come automatically. That is why we are told, pursue peace. So if you have no peace, there is no peace between you and your, or your parents or your, your, your children or your brothers or your sister. It's something that you pursue. It will take effort. Just as Jesus says in Matthew 18 verse 15, if your brother has sinned against you, go and tell him. So it is something that we pursue. It uh, might not come automatically as we think. And therefore, brothers and sisters, in conclusion, our first reading, and the theme is coming from uh, Genesis chapter 50 and it's about Joseph and we can say having looked at godliness and contentment reconciliation and peace that Joseph is a great example of the four, four things that we have discussed this morning in terms of godliness we know that Joseph was godly seven times it is mentioned and God was with Joseph seven times God was with Joseph when he was tempted he said how can I do such a thing and sin against my God? So he was able to resist temptations. He was godly. We can say he was also contented because when he was put in the pit, he did not complain. When he was sold to Potiphar's house, he did not complain. He was contented there until he became the leader. When he was put in prison, he was contented until he became the leader in prison. So about contentment, we can learn from him. About reconciliation, you have read and you have heard that the brothers hated him they sold him to Egypt they put him to pit and he was reconciled 
this time when they came to buy food, he said, come, I'll put you in Goshen. I have no problem with you. And now when the father died, they thought that now Joseph was treating us well because our father was alive. But now he is dead, he is going to revenge. And he says, I have no need for revenge. I have no need for retaliation. I have no need for vigilance. Because I'm not in the place of God. You meant it for evil, but God has meant it for good to do what is happening today, the saving of many lives. So I have no need for revenge. I am not bitter. I have no resentment. I am going to feed you. I am going to do you well. That is the reconciliation. You can imagine about Potiphar's wife. Sometimes we may think about the, the, his brothers, but we, let us think about the Potiphar's wife. When he was released from prison, and now he is uh, second in command, what could he has, have done? He could have said, now, you put me to prison on, trumped, uh, on forced charges, and I stayed there. Now, I am going to show you. But he didn't say that, because he was a messenger of reconciliation. And that means that if there is somebody who has done you wrong, you don't have to be bitter. You don't have to hold resentment on you. You just forgive. Say, you have meant it for evil, but God will turn it to be, to be for good. So he was a minister of reconciliation. And through that, we can see he had peace with his brothers, he had peace with the people, and he had peace, what we would call eternal peace. You can imagine if we reverged, he could have said, now our dad is dead. Remember what you did to me? Now it's time for me. It is payback time. He took them, he could have taken them and put them in prison. But if he did that, do you think he would have peace? Eternal peace? No, he would not be experiencing peace knowing that his brothers are in prison. But because he reconciled and forgave them, then he died in peace at 110 years. So brothers and sisters, this morning, God is telling us that godliness and contentment we will build reconciliation and peace. And may we enjoy that reconciliation and that peace. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, this morning we thank you for speaking to us. We pray that Jehovah God, that your word will have a place in our hearts, that it may continue to bear fruit. We pray that Jehovah God, if there is any one of us here who is in need of reconciliation with you, Jehovah God, rather than staying as an enemy to you, Jehovah God, we pray that through Jesus Christ, that all of us will be reconciled to you. And we pray that Jehovah God, if there is any one of us, Jehovah God, who needs to be reconciled with his brother or sister, Jehovah God, we pray that you may help us to pursue peace, Jehovah God, and be godly. Father, for without holiness, no one will see you. We commit ourselves to you and pray that God, that you may help us. For this is a prayer of faith in Jesus' name. God bless you.